Thank you. I'd like to uh, add my voice of welcome. Um, this is our annual Jurist in Residence lecture, and after my brief introduction, the lecture will take place for about an hour, and then after that, I hope all of you will join us in the gallery, which is in this building, for a reception. I want to thank Dean Johnson, um, my, my fellow faculty members here at Widener Law Commonwealth, our alumni, all for their support for this annual event. Um, I'd also like to thank Sandy Grafe, who many of you met at the table on the way in. Her work and support on these events is very important, and without her, we wouldn't be able to do any of this. Um, Brian Fernbaugh for his audiovisual help. Um, we also have two law and government student fellows who are here, Jocelyn Schultz and Jenna Moscato. They're in the back. I want to thank them for their help with this event. And at the end of Judge Brobson's lecture, there will be some time for question and answer. And I just ask that you wait for either Jocelyn or Jenna to bring you a handheld microphone before you ask your question so that PCN can pick up your question. We also have a lot of current Widener Law Commonwealth students who are here today. If you're a current Widener Law Commonwealth student, you raise your hand real quick. So welcome to um, all of our current students who are here. Um, I want to just tell you a little bit about the Law and Government Institute. It's dedicated to the study of government law, including study of how government works, including the role of lawyers in government. And lawyers are heavily involved in the function of government. They provide legal advice to the governor, they write legislation, they represent clients before a state agency. And at Widener Law Commonwealth, students may earn a certificate in government law that provides them with hands-on experience learning about the role lawyers play in government. And the Law and Government, in government Institute is proud to sponsor the Jurist in Residence Lecture, and we're thrilled to welcome our new Jurist in Residence, Commonwealth Court Judge Kevin P. Brobson. Judge Brobson is an alumnus of our law school, and we are so proud to welcome him as our jurist in residence. In addition to his work on the Commonwealth Court, Judge Brobson's private practice of law also focused on government law, and we're so lucky to be able to access his wealth of knowledge, his experience, and for me, perhaps most importantly, his great sense of humor. Students have the opportunity to engage with Judge Brobson not only through this lecture, but also through a class Judge Brobson is currently teaching on the intersections of the rights to know and to privacy. Please join me in welcoming Judge Brobson. It's a great honor for me as a Widener alum to stand up here as Widener Commonwealth Law School's new jurist in residence, um, especially in the room where I actually studied for the bar examination. Um, but uh, with the exception of uh, the students being a little bit younger than I remember, uh, it does feel like coming home. So thank you very much. Um, I want to start my remarks with actually some recognitions and some thank yous. First, I want to thank Dean Christian Johnson for the appointment as the jurist in residence. I do appreciate your faith in me. Thank you so much, Dean Johnson. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Chief Justice of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, Justice Tom Saylor, Chief Justice Tom Saylor, and President Judge Mary Hannah Levitt of the Commonwealth Court who preceded me in this post. I know they valued very much their interaction with the school and the students, and I'm sure I'm going to have a great experience as well and hope um, that I, I live up to their the standard that they set in the position. Um, I'd like to thank Professor Jill Family and the Law and Government Institute uh, for everything that they do and for supporting the Jurist in Residence program. Uh, I continue to believe that this law school through the Law and Government Institute really provides exceptional training to young lawyers who are seeking a career in government service. Um, finally, uh, at least and finally a recognition here, um, some people could reasonably question the judgment of the school in selecting me as their jurist in residence. Um, but no one should reasonably question the commitment that Widener Law Commonwealth has made to our veterans. These um, men and women who serve our nation deserve our respect. They deserve our prayers, but they also deserve our support when transitioning to careers outside of the military and through 
the Widener Veterans Initiative, Widener uh, serves as an example of uh, serving that commitment, and I'm very grateful and a very proud alumni for the commitment that Widener has made to our veterans. So thank you, Dean Johnson and the school. Um, and considering this is on PCN, if I didn't offer this last thank you, I probably wouldn't be left in the house. Um, I do want to thank my wife, Lauren. She is out. <laughs> She's not here because she is actually out running the kids around all over the place. Um, so if she didn't do that, I wouldn't be here. So honey, thank you very much for doing that for me. I appreciate it. Um, many of you in the audience have heard me speak before and you know that I can sometimes get goaded into offering some opinions probably about matters that uh, under the judicial ethics rules I probably shouldn't get goaded into talking about. But uh, if I do stray into that area, I want everybody to understand that they are my personal opinions and my personal perspectives. They are not the perspectives of uh, my colleagues or my court. With that, I want to tell you why I chose the topic that I chose today for the lecture. When I was in my third year of law school, I took a seminar called Simply the Right to Privacy. And the seminar was offered by Professor Bob Menzel, who no longer teaches here at this school, but he teaches in a much warmer client. Our climate. Uh, he's down in Miami. Um, and it wasn't a, sort of the standard law school course uh, where you learn about uh, the cases and the standards and you apply them to facts and like that. It was more of a, it was more of a theory course. And sure, we, we studied precedent. We studied precedent in the development of the right to privacy. Um, but it was really an origins course about the different concepts of privacy and how courts over the past hundred, over 100 years have struggled with this concept called the right to privacy. You can imagine that in the classroom there was a lot of debate uh, around the table uh, about these origins, about the right to privacy, particularly when it came to discussions of particular cases like uh, Griswold versus Connecticut, a famous 1965 decision dealing with constitutional privacy, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but in the end, and, and sort of unlike any other law school class that I had up to that point, there really weren't any right or wrong answers. We agreed to disagree on a lot of things. And I think all of us in that class left the better for it because in our profession, um, we need professionals and lawyers that are willing to work and think in those gray areas. Now, my interest in privacy waned when I went into private practice. Um, and it didn't really get rekindled until I got elected to the Commonwealth Court in 2009. I became a judge in January 2010, and this was about two years after Pennsylvania sw uh, passed sweeping reform to its open records law, now known as the right to know law. And this, the sweeping reform was intended to provide greater access and greater transparency in government, uh, easier for the public to obtain what are public records and should be open uh, to the public. Several provisions in that law were in furtherance of that goal, but as you can imagine with any new piece of legislation, uh, there was a lot of litigation. Much of the litigation is in fact over this idea of what is private and what is public. I think we can all agree, based on our experiences, that government at all levels compiles a great deal of information on all of us. Uh, they, ma they maintain it in extensive records of employees, of people who do business with the Commonwealth, um, and just of our general citizenry. So the thing about it is personal information may not always be private information. And it may or, not, may, or ne may or may not be expressly protected under the statutory exemptions that exist in the right to know law or under other state laws or federal laws. So the focus of the discussion today is going to be on informational privacy and how that right to informational privacy is protected in the context of uh, open record statutes generally, but I'm really going to focus on Pennsylvania's right to know law because that's what I really know and deal with on a daily basis. We're going to start with uh, some discussion of the origins of the right to privacy, and we're going to talk about a big R right and a little R right. Um, and we're going to talk about the, dis the development of the concept of the right to privacy in tort law the development of the right to privacy under the United States Constitution, and I'm going to touch briefly on the development of the right in state constitutions. Just to be clear, I am not going to engage in any heavy discussion of search and seizure law. You could spend hours having a discussion just on search and seizure. I'm also going to stay fairly far afield from getting into discussions about Griswold um, and its progeny. 
As you can imagine, there's a, been a lot of debate about that line of cases, so I'm going to try and steer clear of that one as well. Uh, then after doing some origins on the right to privacy, I want to talk a little bit about the origins and the desire and the need for government transparency and for the public to hold their government accountable. Then how the right to low law in Pennsylvania addresses both what is public and what is private. And then I'll issue some closing observations on how I think privacy and government accountability can coexist. And then hopefully we'll have an opportunity for some Q&A. So let's go. In terms of the right to privacy from, uh, from a tort base, the historical jumping off point is 1890. And at that point in time in the Harvard Law Review, Samuel D. Warren and, Lewin D., uh, Samuel D. Warren and Louis D. Brandeis published their now famous article called simply The Right to Privacy. Um, at the time of this publication, they were both law partners, they were law, former law school classmates, uh, they were actually very good friends. We all know that Brandeis would go on to become an associate justice of the United States Supreme Court. Samuel D. Warren was not necessarily that famous, uh, but he was an accomplished lawyer up in Boston, Massachusetts. And in this article, uh, Warren and Brandeis urged the recognition of a new common law tort for invasion of privacy, which didn't exist at that point in time. Now, a little lore is that Brandeis actually was the scrivener, and Brandeis is on the right, Samuel Warren is on the left, that Brandeis was actually the scrivener of this article at Warren's urging. Um, if you read the article, and I've said this to my class, these guys were mad. They were mad um, about um, what they viewed to be a complete invasion of social norms of what should be private and what people should be entitled to keep private. And particularly concerned about technological advances in the area of photography and the media and the development of tabloid journalism and, and what would be the 1890 equivalent of paparazzi. Um, so, why was the article written has been the subject of a lot of debate over the years. I recently found a University of Illinois uh, review from November 2007 by Professor Amy Jada. And Amy Jada basically says that um, this article wouldn't have been written unless Warren had married into a politically connected family. He married the daughter of a Del United States Delaware senator. They were married in Washington, D.C. And the story goes that he was just completely put off by the fact that every time he would go to a social function with his wife, um, that the, 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 the cameras would follow and there would be an article written. And it was basically, it was basically the creation of tabloid journalism. Um, so but for him never marrying this woman, uh, we wouldn't have this, at least according to one professor's research, this, this right to privacy, this, 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 uh, this chapter of, of great American legal literature. So what were they really upset about? I said technology. Well, this was a camera in 1890. This is what these guys were upset about. Now, I have no idea what, what Warren and Brandeis would think about the fact that every one of you was walking around with a camera in your pocket. But this is exactly what uh, Warren was upset about and what Brandeis agreed to write about uh, when they wrote this article. And what they were urging was the creation of a common law, what they called right to be let alone. And they said that this was as worthy of a cause of action and a remedy as a battery, a trespass, an assault, and as well, as well as statutory causes of actions that existed at the time for copyright and trademark infringement. And they said that it was necessary, they urged the creation of this common law right to be let alone as necessary to stop the press from overstepping the obvious bounds of propriety and decency. And that's what the concern led them to focus on in their article is the publication of private affairs. And this is what they wrote, quote, when personal gossip attains the dignity of print, what wonder that the ignorant and thoughtless mistake its relative importance. I wish I could write like these guys. I mean, they really knew how to write. And this article is a relatively brief article. It's not that long, but it conveys such interesting legal thought. 
Defamation existed at the time. One would wonder why defamation wasn't sufficient to take care of this. Well, Warren and Brandeis addressed that. It's just not good enough. Defamation, libel and slander, actually requires reputational injury. Warren and Brandeis weren't worried about reputational injury. Because you know what? The photo that they took of Warren and his wife coming out of the country club after their lobster dinner could have been absolutely true, and they probably looked really nice. They were, they, what, what they were trying to protect was embarrassment. They were trying to protect, protect the, the loss of self-esteem. The, that's the harm that they were trying to remedy. So reputational injury, that's not what we were talking about or what they were concerned with. So defamation and libel doesn't work. They wanted to address the hurt feelings, the injury to self-esteem that happens when private matters become public. So the right to be let alone is not premised on um, property rights. It's premised on what they refer to as, quote, an inviolate personality. And they said it's equal to the right not to be assaulted, to be falsely imprisoned, not to be maliciously prosecuted, and not to be defamed. Again, using their words, quote, the intensity and complexity of life attend upon adducing a civilization have rendered necessary some retreat from the world, and man, under the refining, refining influence of culture, has become more sensitive to publicity, so that solitude and privacy have become more essential to the individual. So they were urging states at that point in time, through the common, development of the common law, to fill this gap. The common law didn't do it. Tort privacy of contract didn't work. Statutory law didn't work at the point in time. Nothing protected these harms for hurt feelings, mental suffering, embarrassment, when there's a publication of a matter of private concern. Now, they didn't frame the elements of what the tort would be that they were urging to be created, but they did articulate some limitations that had to exist on the tort. And so I'll, I'll tell you what those limitations are, but some of them really come from, this, from defamation. It sounds, very, like, it sounds like defamation without the reputational injury. The first limitation is that the new right has to yield to matters of public concern or public interest. The second one is the right must yield to privileged communications. Privileged communications in the sense of matters written in legislation or matters written in court proceedings, things of that nature. In the case of oral publications, meaning not in newspapers but just oral publications, special damages must be shown. And with special damages, they mean by damages that don't logically flow or are understood or presumed to flow from a violation. Those have to be actually shown. The fourth limitation is that the right ceases upon your voluntary publication of that matter of private concern or giving the consent to someone else to publish that matter. Unlike defamation, truth is not a defense. It can be an actually beautiful picture of you coming out of your country club. And it can be completely true and accurate. But that's, again, not what they were looking at going at. So truth is not a defense. And also, absence of malice is not a defense. So these were the limitations they urged. And over the course of 20, 30 years after they wrote this article, the law started to evolve in their favor to the point where we now have the restatement second of torts recognizing four legal theories on the tort of invasion of privacy. First one deals with unreasonable intrusion upon the seclusion of another. Second one is appropriation of another's name or likeness. The third is unreasonable publicity of another's private life. And the fourth is publicity that unreasonably places another in a false light before the public. And the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, by way of information, has recognized these as uh, torts in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Next, we'll talk about privacy under the US Constitution. That's my son, Gabe. He's nine years old. Um, Gabe wanted to be in the presentation, so I figured I'll put a constitution in his hand, and, and there you go. So in terms of government intrusion into personal matters, depending on the context of the intrusion, there is abundant case law recognizing a United States constitutionally based right to privacy primarily under the Bill of Rights. Now, case, I have to tread lightly here. Case law is really the exclusive source of this right because the word privacy doesn't actually exist in the Constitution. 
Now, there are express rights in the Constitution that are privacy-like. Fourth Amendment, for example, search and seizure law can be considered a right to privacy in your person or your belongings. Um, the First Amendment could be considered a right to privacy in your religious practices and your religious beliefs. And there has been much debate over the decades on whether other portions of the Bill of Rights or the Constitution as a whole creates a broader, more encompassing, constitutionally protected right to privacy. I'm going to steer clear from the debate over that. But for purposes of explaining an origins of the right to privacy, I at least have to touch on some of the case law in the area. So I've picked two cases to talk about. The first one I'm going to talk about, even, and I'm not going to get in depth on it. I promised you that I wouldn't. But I have to talk about Griswold versus Connecticut a little bit. Again, you can't have a discussion about the constitutional right to privacy without talking about Griswold. So Griswold versus Connecticut involved a challenge to a Connecticut statute that outlawed contraceptives, made it criminal. And in that case, uh, the executive director of Planned Parenthood of Connecticut, as well as a physician for Planned Parenthood, were actually charged with violating the state statute. All the Connecticut courts, state courts, affirmed the conviction. And it went up to the Supreme Court on cert. And the question before the Supreme Court was, does this Connecticut law violate due, the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution by invading private, intimate relations between husband and wife? And in a 7-2 decision, the United States Supreme Court reversed the conviction. So how did they get there? Well, they recognized what I told you a minute ago, which is that the word privacy doesn't exist anywhere in the Constitution. So they got that out of the way. But then they went on to say that notwithstanding the absence of the word privacy in the Constitution, the Bill of Rights and the protections of the Bill of Rights have, quote, penumbras. You've all heard that one before, I'm sure. Penumbras formed by emanations from those guarantees that help give a life and substance to the Bill of Rights. Stated otherwise, they identified several amendments to the United States Constitution, the first, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the ninth, and said that each creates, quote, zones of privacy, close quote, that the government may not enter. First Amendment, speech and religion. I mentioned that a little bit before, a little bit earlier. Third, the quartering of soldiers. Quite frankly, I have no idea what the quartering of soldiers has to do with the right to privacy, but they cited it. Fourth Amendment search and seizure, we saw that. We talked about that a little bit. The Fifth Amendment against self-incrimination, I guess that means the right to keep private your own confession or any information that you might have that could be used against you. And then the Ninth Amendment, which is that rights not specifically enumerated or reserved to the people. Now, the Supreme Court would later expand on the whole penumbral view of the right to privacy and the Constitution through the, by adding the Fourth Amendment liberty interest in Roe versus Wade, then Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Now, in Griswold, though, they recognize that these penumbral rights, the right to privacy, they recognized in the penumbral rights a right to privacy that predated even the Constitution itself. And they said marital privacy. And they said that these relations, these marital privacy, private relations, fall within the zone of privacy created by, quote, several fundamental constitutional guarantees. But they really didn't specify which ones. Three key points that I want to leave you with about Griswold. First, and thankfully, they added the word penumbra to our constitutional lexicon. <laughs> Second, they actually recognize a constitutional right to marital privacy. Third, within the penumbra of certain amendments, and despite the absence of the word privacy, the court founds rights existing in the Bill of Rights within zones of privacy. The next case I want to talk to you about is Katz versus United States. Katz is a Fourth Amendment case. It was a conviction that was based on a FBI listening device attached to the outside of a telephone booth. OK, so some of the young people, that's a telephone booth. <laughs> if you wanted to call anybody before phones. <laughs> 
this is where you had to go. Now, the district court and the U.S. Court of Appeals denied the suppression motion. But the Supreme Court reversed. And in doing so, they actually reversed an earlier decision in which Justice Brandeis wrote a dissenting opinion, Olmstead versus the United States. But what they said was, in Katz, they said, the Fourth Amendment protects more than people. It also protects places. And they actually said a physical intrusion isn't necessary to, do, to trigger the Fourth Amendment's protection with regard to a search and seizure. They said the use of an electronic listening device to, intra, to, to listen in on a conversation in a phone booth, quote, violated the privacy upon which the defendant justifiably relied, so as to constitute a search and seizure under the United States Constitution. Now, of course, what that meant was because they didn't have a warrant, exclusionary rule kicked in, conviction was overturned. What's also interesting about Katz is Justice Harlan's concurring opinion. Because in his concurring opinion, he sort of took some uh, confusing language in the majority and he essentially summed it up and basically said, look, what the majority did was they, they, they basically applied a two-part test to determine whether there was a search and seizure. And the two-part test is simply, first, did the person exhibit a subjective expectation in privacy? Meaning, did that person assert a right and take some actual steps to protect it? So in this case, you know, I mean, how many times have you all been outside and somebody's walking down the street with their phone and one of those Bluetooth pieces and they're just walking and having a conversation? That didn't happen here, of course, because they didn't exist. This guy actually went into this phone booth, went into a phone booth, shut it, and that was essentially affirmative steps that he took to keep that conversation that he was having, whoever's on the other line, private. The second part of the test is, the expectation must be one that society is prepared to recognize as reasonableness, as reasonable. So there's a subjective test and an objective component to the test that Justice Harlan articulated in his concurring opinion in Katz. The United States Supreme Court would go on um, to adopt that test officially as its test in Smith versus Maryland in 1979 opinion. Um, another word of caveat, my old crim pro professor is in the audience. Professor Deem, if I got anything wrong, um, please reserve your judgment until later on. You can correct me, okay? <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> now, the third area of privacy they wanted to talk about was privacy under state constitutions. I'm actually, you know, state constitutions tend to take a back seat to the United States Constitution when it comes to almost every right that you can imagine. And if you're the young lawyers in the room, I really encourage you when you're dealing with these issues, these constitutional issues, don't just stop at the United States Constitution. Really look to see what your state constitution says about those rights. Um, but because they do play an important role in the development of the law, particularly in the area of privacy. I'm not going to get too far into it today. Um, in fact, I'm not going to get any farther into it today, other than to commend to you then Professor Ken Gormley's article uh, called 100 Years of Privacy. Uh, he is now the president of Duquesne University, but he wrote an excellent article in the Wisconsin Law Review that uh, spends a little bit of time talking about the development of privacy under state constitutions. So I commend that, that piece to you. Transparency and accountability. Okay, this is my 14-year-old son who didn't want to be in this presentation, <laughs> but my son Gabe really wanted him to be. So, so this is him, me holding him accountable for not doing his homework, and he's on the computer doing it. Um, in our country, in our nation's history, we have a, a long history of encouraging the public to hold our government, our elected officials, officials accountable to their actions. In 1982, James Madison was responding to a letter from W.T. Barry, who lived in Kentucky at the time, and he wrote this. A popular government without popular information or the means of acquiring it is but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy, or perhaps both. Knowledge will forever govern ignorance, and a people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power which knowledge gives. Now, Barry wrote to Madison seeking a reaction from Madison or seeking input from Madison on Kentucky's efforts to create a statewide educational system. So, likely 
Madison was not talking about education in the form of government transparency. He was talking about education in the form of, of educating our children. But the quote is often cited in reference to both. And Madison is at least consistent. Because when Madison wrote in the Federalist, Madison wrote in the Federalist 49, he wrote, a constitutional road to the decision of the people ought to be marked out and kept open. So we have a history and we have a tradition of holding our government accountable through the exercise of our freedom of speech and of the press. And a lot of that relies upon the availability of information to hold them accountable and exercising those rights under the Constitution. This was a departure from uh, the common law of England. So under the common law of England, words spoken against a public official were long considered, and I'm going to try my Latin here, scandalum magnatum. And basically, that meant you went to jail if you spoke out against the king or the country. So the right to transparency, the, the right to transparency, the right to have this information is inextricably intertwined with our obligation and our duty to question our government. So the freedom to question of the government is actually diminished where the information that we need to question the government is kept away from us. Warren and Brandeis knew this back when they were in 1890, because you remember one of the limitations that they put in this tort right to privacy was the limitation that says, you know, all bets are off if this is a matter of public interest or a matter of public concern. And the United States Supreme Court recognized it in the seminal case of New York Times versus Sullivan in 1964, where they held that the public, a public official's common law defamation action it cannot diminish or discourage the exercise of freedom of speech or freedom of the pe press, even if it turns out that the matter that was published was false. And this is what they wrote. The constitutional guarantees require, we think, a federal rule that prohibits a public official from recovering damages for a defamatory falsehood relating to his official conduct unless he proves that the statement was made with actual malice, that is, with knowledge that it was false or with a reckless disregard of whether it was false or not. So transparency and accountability are intertwined. Transparency is the means of achieving accountability through the exercise of our rights of freedom of speech and freedom of the press. I'm looking around the room, and I know some people in this room are waiting for you to get to this. The right to know law in Pennsylvania. One of my favorite laws in Pennsylvania, as some of you are probably aware. The right to know law in Pennsylvania is a transparency tool that helps the citizenry hold the government accountable. The 2008 law significantly broadened access to public records. It did so in a couple of different ways. First, it created a presumption that all records in the possession of a government agency are public records accessible under the law. Second, it put the burden on the agency that possesses the record to establish that the record was, in fact, exempt or not subject to disclosure. And third, it created the Office of Open Records, this independent office within the executive branch of state government that had two primary responsibilities. First, the responsibility to educate agencies and the public about the right to know law and the access to information. And second, to serve as an impartial arbiter of disputes over open records requests. So when you make an open records request and it's denied, there's an appeal to the Office of Open Records and the Office of Open Records adjudicates that dispute. So what about personal information? What about this personal information that we know the government has on all of us? How does it how does the right to know law take care of that? Well, the General Assembly actually recognized what I said earlier, that the government amasses an incredible amount of information on all of us. Information that maybe we were compelled to, through circumstances beyond our own control, to actually give to the government. And they have it. So the General Assembly did a couple of things. They had expressed provisions in the statute itself to help balance the interests of privacy and personal information with the interests of access. The first way that they did it was statutory exemptions. So Section 708B of the Right to Know Law contains several statutory exemptions. Not all of them 
you could characterize as privacy protections, but many of them you can, such as medical records and health history, social security numbers, personal financial information, trade secret and confidential information. And identifying information of a child that is 17 age, years of age or younger. I think we can probably all agree that that is information that should be kept private and not made public. So there's those statutory exemptions. What's interesting about that, though, is the right to know law also makes them qualified exemptions. And they're qualified in this sense. Even if a record is exempt under one of these statutory exemptions, under certain circumstances, an agency can still disclose it. And the way they would disclose it is where the agency does a balancing test, where the public interest favoring access outweighs any individual agency or public interest that may favor restriction. So you have the statutory exemptions. Here's another way that the General Assembly crafted the law to, make the ba to, to strike the balance, and that is in the definition of record. My com the Commonwealth Court issued a decision in 2015 that called Pennsylvania Office of Attorney General versus Philadelphia Inquirer. This litigation stemmed out of uh, media reports about uh, alleged exchanges of pornographic emails or insensitive emails or uh, racially discriminatory emails uh, between lawyers, prosecutors, judges, what have you, within and outside of government. The Philadelphia Inquirer sent a right to know law request to the Attorney General. And this is what the request was for. It was a request for emails, quote, of a personal nature and involving pornographic or otherwise inappropriate material to or from email accounts of OAG employees. The question before the court in that case was whether those emails in the possession of an agency fell within the scope of the right to know law. Remember, the right to know law provides access to public records. And what the court held was that personal emails, even if in the possession of an agency, do not fall within the scope of the right to know law because they don't meet the definition of a record in the right to know law. A record is defined in the right to know law as information, regardless of physical form, or characteristics that documents an activity or transaction of an agency and that is created or received or retained pursuant to law or in connection with that transaction business or activity of the agency. The request in the Philadelphia Inquirer case specifically said personal emails. It didn't tie the request to any particular activity or transaction of an agency. Therefore, the request didn't seek information that met the definition of a record, and the Attorney General's office was not compelled as a matter of law to produce it. The final way that there's a balance of the uh, right to privacy with the need for transparency to hold our government accountable is a Pennsylvania constitutional right to privacy. I said I'd get into that one. And here, I'm gonna, what I'm talking about is the most recent decision from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court on the to topic, and this is uh, Pennsylvania State Education Association versus Office of Open Records, or what those of us who went through this whole case call, refer to affectionately as PSEA 3. So why is it 3? Um, and it's because it, the, the case came to the Commonwealth Court in a fairly unusual procedural posture. Under the right to know law, the process is fairly straightforward. You make your request to an agency, the agency reviews your request, they either give you the records that you requested or they deny your request. If they deny it, you get to appeal it to the Office of Open Records. The Office of Open Records will adju adjudicate the basis for denial, issue a decision. Dissatisfied with that, the requester may appeal it to the Commonwealth Court and, and we decide it. In this case, in the PSEA case, the PSEA apparently anticipating, if not already experiencing among its members, that some would use the right to know law to obtain personal information about their members, filed a preemptive strike. They came to the Commonwealth Court in the Commonwealth Court's original jurisdiction 
on a declaratory judgment action, basically asking for a ruling against the Office of Open Records saying, no matter what comes to you, you are not permitted as a matter of law to give out the home address of teachers under the right to know law. And they had several theories in support of that. Now, we actually kicked it out originally because we said, no, there's a statutory process. What you need to do is you need to have a request. The request has to be granted or denied. You need to be able to challenge it. And remember, we're talking about requests for school records. For those, so those were actually requests that are at a local government agency, not a state government agency. So those requests would be denied. It'd go to the Office of Open Records. But instead of coming to our court, they would go to the Common Pleas Court. So there was a process. And we said, look, you have to follow the statutory process. You can't sort of do an end run around it and come to the Commonwealth Court's original jurisdiction. So we bounced it. Uh, they appealed that order to PSEA, appealed that order to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court reversed and sent it back to us and said, deal with it. <laughs> it's one of those drop the mic moments, you know, <laughs> boom. So we said, okay. Um, and we ruled against the PSEA in the case. That was PSEA 2, our decision. And what we said was we actually looked at our prior precedent in this area of uh, requests for home addresses, because you'd be surprised how many people in the public want home addresses. Um, but we looked at our prior precedent in that, and the prior precedent actually relied on a Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision in 2003 called Commonwealth versus Duncan. And that was a search and seizure case. Uh, it was basically a Fourth Amendment search and seizure case. And in that, the Supreme Court said what I thought very clearly. What they said was, in a modern society, a person's name and address is not information about which a person can have a reasonable expectation of privacy that the public is willing to recognize and protect. Second part of Harlan's test, right? Reasonable expectation of privacy. The Supreme Court said there is no reasonable expectation of privacy in home address in Duncan. And in the absence of a reasonable expectation of privacy, we felt, well, there can be no constitutionally protected right to privacy in your home address. And we looked at the exemptions in the right to know law. And the exemptions in the right to know law, there's many of them. But one of the ex express exemptions is a protection for home address of law enforcement officer and judges. Now, under principles of statutory construction, when the General Assembly creates an exemption for one class of people, it usually means they did not intend to create an exemption for other classes of people. So we said that that was an expression of the General Assembly's intent not to shield home addresses of other government, of, of other people in the possession of agencies from production under the right to know law. So that was our decision in PSEA 3. And the PSEA, represented by a very able lawyer, uh, appealed that case to the Supreme Court. And because it was in our original jurisdiction, the Supreme Court had no choice. They had to take it. It wasn't a matter of discretion. They had to take the case. What the Supreme Court did was they reversed. And the Supreme Court held that home addresses enjoyed a privacy protection under Pennsylvania's Constitution and that the public interest in access to those home addresses did not, now, did not outweigh the teacher's privacy right. So how did they get there? First, they referred to, quote, various rights to privacy, close quote, in the Pennsylvania Constitution. They actually quoted specifically to Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, which is Pennsylvania's equivalent of the Fourth Amendment. That's the provision that Commonwealth versus Duncan was decided under. And they noted that the courts apply the whole two-part Justice Harlan test in those cases. At that point in time, the court pivoted. They pivoted to, of all places, Warren and Brandeis. Now, remember, Warren and Brandeis were upset with the media. They weren't talking about a constitutional right to privacy. They were talking about a right to privacy recognized vis-a-vis -vis private citizens in a civilized society. The Supreme Court nonetheless went to Warren and Brandeis and, and said, Warren and Brandeis recognized this quote, right to be let alone. Again, it's a tort concept, not a constitutional concept. 
Then they linked Warren and Brandeis's article from 1890 to Griswold. And the law that developed after Griswold. And they cited Article 1, Section 1 of the Pennsylvania Constitution, which they said provides a broader panoply, or penumbra, if you will, of privacy rights than the search and seizure context. Article 1, Section 1 provides, all men are born equally free and independent and have certain inherent and indefeasible rights, among which are those of enjoying and defending life and liberty, of acquiring, possessing, and protecting property and reputation, and of pursuing their own happiness. For those of you keeping track, the word privacy doesn't exist anywhere in there. So what did they do? They went full Griswold. They embraced Griswold. They embraced the penumbral theory when it comes to the Pennsylvania Constitution. They embraced this concept of zones of privacy and that the right to privacy that exists within these zones to privacy within Article I, Section 1 of the Pennsylvania Constitution are in addition to the exemptions. So not only do I have a statutory right to privacy under the right to know law in my home address, the Constitution protects me as well. They also adopted the balancing test. This is the balancing test that I indicated earlier actually exists in the right to know law, and that's just because you have a privacy interest does not mean the information is not subject to disclosure, because you have to balance that privacy interest and the public's interest in the information and the dissemination of the information. And the Supreme Court said the public, schools rep the public school teachers represented by PSEA had a, quote, strong privacy interest, close quote, in their home addresses protected by Article I, Section 1 of the Pennsylvania Constitution. And as I mentioned earlier, when they did the balancing test, they said there was no compelling need for the public to know. What about Duncan, which is the decision that our court had relied on? What did, what did they say about Duncan? This is what they said about Duncan. They didn't over, the Supreme Court didn't overrule Duncan, but they found it irrelevant. They said, oh, that's a search and seizure case. That's under Article One. Try not to laugh. <laughs> I'm not laughing. They, um, they said that's a search and seizure case under Article I, Section 8 of the Pennsylvania Constitution. We're talking about the right to informational privacy under Article I, Section 1 of the Pennsylvania Constitution. That's what they said about Duncan. It's also interesting to hear what they said about the balancing test and how they employed it. And this is a long quote, so bear with me, but it is, it's, it's very significant at least in my view. We likewise perceive no public benefit or interest to disclosure in response to such generic requests for irrelevant personal information of these particular public employees who have undertaken the high calling of educating our children. To the contrary, nothing in the right to know law suggests that it was ever intended to be used as a tool to procure personal information about private citizens or in the worst sense, to be a generator of mailing lists. Public agencies are not clearinghouses of bulk personal information otherwise protected by constitutional privacy rights. While the goal of the legislation to make more rather than less information available to public scrutiny is laudable, the constitutional rights of the citizens of this commonwealth to be left alone remains a significant countervailing force. So after PSEA 3 and the couple of months we've been living with it, we have this new paradigm, which is basically when personal information is sought of an, when, when, when a personal information request is made, when somebody makes a right to know law request for what is personal information of an agency, that agency must actually do a privacy analysis under the Pennsylvania Constitution. As with Griswold, I offer you some interesting thoughts about interesting thoughts and observations about PSCA 3. First, I found it interesting that they used the tort-based right to privacy and the right to be let alone to ferret out a constitutional privacy concept. I wonder whether they did so intentionally. 
And the reason why I wonder that is because I wonder if the Supreme Court was signaling that perhaps an agency might be forgiven for releasing the information, but that the tort-based cause of action for invasion of privacy might be available against the requester who takes that information that is otherwise personal and private and makes it public. Other interesting thought. Home addresses apparently have a diminished, a diminished expectation of privacy under the Fourth Amendment. So it's basically protected and private information unless there's an investigation going on of criminal activity, then it's not. I also found it interesting that there really is no analysis of the Supreme Court's conclusion that the teachers specifically had a, quote, strong right to privacy in their home addresses, which at least seems to conflict with what the Supreme Court said in Duncan. And they said this, since in this day and age where people routinely disclose their names and addresses to all manner of public and private entities and are thus readily available to the public, there can be no reasonable expectation of privacy in that information. I also wonder by creating this right to privacy under the Constitution and requiring a balancing test of agencies before they produce personal information, what this means in terms of a right or remedy for people whose personal, agents, personal information is disclosed by an agency that fails to do the balancing test. And I guess my final observation is about PSEA 3 is they at least seem to have adopted our court's view that the right to know law is not a statute about transparency for transparency's sake. That the right to know law has to be based on a request that is tied somehow to holding government accountable. That not every piece of information that the government has is a record that can be sought under the right to know law. It's probably going to take a little bit of time to sort out the fallout from PSCA 3, um, but I am curious to find out what other information agencies have, other than home addresses, that are going to start to have to be subject to this balancing test that the Supreme Court has invoked under Article 1, Section 1 of the Pennsylvania Constitution. So, these three ways, the statutory exemption, what is a record, and this right to privacy in PSCA 3 are the ways that the General Assembly and the courts in Pennsylvania have attempted to strike the balance between what is public and what is private. It must be a record, it can't be exempt or privileged, and there's a constitutionality test to determine whether it has to be produced. Now some of my just a few closing thoughts, which led me to this reasonable expectation of transparency, which as you can see now is sort of this mishmash between reasonable expectation of privacy and the need for government transparency. Right now, according to Gallup, the confidence in institutions across the board with the exception of our police and our military and our small business is at an all time low and trending lower. There is an indirect correlation between a clamor for transparency and confidence. You know, Rod Ronald Reagan used to use this old Russian proverb loosely translated to trust but verify. Trust is actually a synonym for confidence. And confidence in our institution falls very quickly with just one act by just one person. So, you know, as public officials, we have to continue to strive every day to try to hold the confidence up of the people in our institutions and for me personally in our courts. When there's a lack of confidence and there's a lack of trust, people want everything. You know, it used to be that nobody wanted to know how the sausage was made, <laughs> right? Now with confidence in the gutter, everybody wants to know what's going into the sausage because there's afraid something's in there that shouldn't be in there. So we have to work as, as, as 
as your trusted servants to build that confidence back up. Not because we want to keep what is private is in the sausage, but because for tr transparency for transparency's sake is just an endless road. We have a goal. The goal of the right to know law is not transparency. The goal of the right to know law is accountability. We have to balance the accountability and the need for transparency against the privacy rights of our citizenry. And the goal of accountability is something that I will speak for my colleagues. We look at these right to know law cases in that prism. It's about accountability. And transparency is a tool to get us there. And I promise you I'll keep that in mind as I continue to review these cases and review this law. And with that, I have nothing further, but we can take some questions. Judge, thanks for taking my question. Um, I haven't taken it yet. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you will. Do you think the result would have been different in the Attorney General versus Inquirer case if the request had been phrased differently? So if they didn't center it on personal emails, but rather they said something like um, emails that show misuse or malfeasance, including emails that show pornographic content or inappropriate content on government servers or government email systems? I think it could have been different. I can't say that it would have been different. It certainly would have been a different analysis. Um, there were probably many different theories about why that information should be available or why it shouldn't be available. But at least in the opinion, what drove the analysis in the opinion, if you read it, was the way the request was phrased. That doesn't mean that if a request is phrased differently, the result is going to be necessarily different but certainly it would lead to a different analysis. Of course, I can't tell you what the result would be under different facts because then I'd have to recuse and I wouldn't be able to decide it. But, but, but I, think, I, I think you can see when you read the opinion that it was definitely, the court's analysis was definitely driven by the nature of the request itself. Thank you. Hi, Judge. Um, do you think by the Supreme Court and PSEA 3 tying the right to privacy to Article 1, Section 1, which is all men or all individuals, was thereby making it an individualized right that an agency potentially could only assert on behalf of individuals knowing that those individuals had a right to pri or had a privacy concern? Because one thought I had when reading PSEA with the individualized right and tying it just to that was at least in that case, you had an entity that arguably had standing on behalf of a number of representatives that wanted to protect that information preemptively. So do you think that makes a difference? So now the onus is on an agency to assess that before it releases the information? Or is an agency able to take, or a business for that matter, able to take an uh, institutional right of privacy, like some entities, like Hobby Lobby, there's an institutional freedom of exercise, uh, religious exercise. Is that possible, or do you think they meant to limit it to individuals? I think there's a lot about the Supreme Court's decision in PSEA 3 that agencies are going to have to struggle with. Um, that the word, that, the, that, the, that Article 1, Section 1 talks about individual rights is not that different from the way the United States Constitution talks about individual rights and liberties and things like that. So, but I think what's, what's, what, what ties into your answer is the portion of the opinion in PSEA 3 I didn't talk about, which was something that our court has written about a couple of times, and that's the idea that, you know, there are these exceptions in the right to low law, and now there's this protection under Article 1, Section 1 for privacy. 
those rights really belong to the people whose information is being sought, yet there's really nothing in the statute that gives those individuals um, a, a say in, in the process. So, I, you know, so, so that's difficult to say it's an individual right unless there's some ability or way for the individual to assert it. So what I think the Supreme Court has said in PSCA 3 is, look, until that's fixed, or at least until that's fixed, it may, it, this may go on in perpetuity, the agencies have to be the guardians of these rights, and they have to do these balancing tests. And um, you know, I think they probably have to do it en masse. One could interpret the Supreme Court's decision in PSCA 3 to say, this only applies to teachers. But there are many, I can't remember the exact words that the Supreme Court used, but there are many dedicated, faithful public servants. <laughs> um, not that teachers don't deserve a great deal of respect um, for, for the services that they provide, but there are many a great deal of public servants out there working day in and day out who are doing so to support their families, but don't necessarily expect that because that's the job that they have to put food on their table, that now their address is going to be publicly available. So it's, it's hard for me to think of that that concept that the Supreme Court has set forth in PSCA 3 couldn't be readily applied to other groups of state or local government employees. And I think that you can read PSCA 3 to say to the agencies who receive these requests, not the Office of Open Records, mind you, but the actual agencies who receive these requests, be careful <laughs> before you put this stuff out. Because what you need to do is, if this is private or personal information, you need to somehow violate whether, you need to somehow decide whether there is a protected privacy interest. And I think the Supreme Court left that one open. They didn't really articulate a test. They seem to have gone against Duncan. So I'm not sure how you decide whether information is private and protected. And then once you make that determination agencies, then you've got to do this balancing test. So I don't think it applies to an individual one, one off because that's not really the nature of the way the requests come in. I think, I think agencies are smart enough now to know that if, an, if, if someone comes in and says, I want the address of Frank Kosnitsky, that the agency is going to call up Frank Kosnitsky and say, hey, some guy's in here and he wants your address. I think the problem is a little more difficult when they say, I want the address of every person that you have employed over the last two years. Then I think it becomes more difficult.